Chen. I'm the head of the Sea Water Mandate and president of the Pacific Institute. Um, today, we're going to do a webinar focusing on uh, innovative partnerships and tools that can help inform basin investments. Um, Many companies uh, have been beginning to think about uh, investing in basin health initiatives uh, and to go beyond operational uh, excellence on, in their sites. Um, and uh, even uh, looking at uh, ways of improving water security uh, and uh, water resilience in basins that they have operations. Sometimes this manifests through the form of replenish goals uh, but otherwise looking uh, also just to invest in uh, ecosystem health. Uh, some of you may recall uh, a, a survey instrument the mandate uh, did late last year where we uh, asked uh, member companies to weigh in on the things that they found most valuable about the initiative and there was a sense that there was a real opportunity for peer learning given that uh, leading companies are innovating in various dimensions of water stewardship. Uh, and so we're looking now within the mandate to uh, do more of such uh, webinars to share some of these innovative practices and partnerships uh, and see if we can help scale uh, some of those uh, efforts. Uh, this one's gonna focus on uh, partnerships and diagnostic tools that help uh, inform uh, basin investments, but we'll do uh, many other uh, types of these uh, webinars uh, in the months to come. This conversation spurred out of uh, a dialogue that was happening uh, within uh, a uh, initiative of the Sea Water Mandate, the Water Resilience Coalition, uh, whereby members were uh, dialoguing around how best to uh, 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 get the bang for the buck from investments uh, in basins of shared interest. Uh, and we thought instead of just uh, talking about these tools uh, within the coalition to actually broaden the discussion to include all mandate endorsers. So thanks for taking the time out of your day to be here and uh, uh, looking forward to this discussion. So a few housekeeping uh, items, um, as I mentioned to some that are, were registered or uh, logged in early, we are gonna mute um, the uh, microphones at, for attendees at least until the end and we'll see whether we can unmute for those that would like to make interventions verbally uh, but while we're doing the presentations we would encourage you to use the q a function or the chat function to uh, input your comments or questions um, we will uh, after each demo take a few questions uh, but then would like to also have the some time at the end for uh, discussion around uh, how such uh, decision support tools can inform uh, inv investments in basins. We're going to start, uh, next slide please, we're going to start with uh, the Basin Scout uh, platform uh, that has uh, um, manifest through a partnership uh, with Microsoft and Paul will tee that, that presentation up uh, and then turn to his uh, partners uh, to demonstrate that platform. Uh, and then we'll take a few questions, and as I mentioned, and then we'll, uh, we'll shift our attention to a, a partnership that Dow has with a number of organizations to develop this IS, uh, ESII tool. Uh, and then at the end, um, we'll uh, enable everyone to get into the conversation and share their experiences uh, in, uh, with such uh, investments in basins. So with that, uh, I think I'm turning next to Paul, over to you. Great, thank, thank you, Jason, for that. And, and thank you um, for setting up these opportunities. I think it's uh, really one of the benefits of being part of the mandate is to be able to uh, learn from each other and learn about what we're doing. So I'll be brief. Uh, like many companies on the call, we have a replenishment commitment. And um, as we go about implementing that commitment, um, I'm always looking for opportunities to kind of bring new tools to the table that, um, can facilitate and uh, further our, our ability to implement that replenishment commitment and, and pursue uh, stewardship opportunities. And as a tech company and a platform company, we're also 
um, always looking for opportunities to figure out how to uh, enable the deployment of technology and AI and machine learning to in the water space, um, which I think is a really ripe uh, uh, place and space for uh, to infuse sort of technology approaches to facilitate water management. And so I, I learned about the this uh, platform, Basis Scout platform, and the partnership between the Freshwater Trust and Upstream Tech. And I was really thrilled and intrigued by the potential of this tool to, to do just that, to facilitate uh, on the ground targeted interventions and also to deploy technology in, in the service of improving water management. So uh, we made an investment to uh, support the configuration of this tool for the Sacramento Valley which uh, I, I think there's a couple of companies on the call that have operational interests there. Um, and uh, I think the, the demo will be anchored in that place, but uh, it's really critical to keep in mind that this is a portable tool. Um, it, it can be deployed in really globally with uh, dependent to a certain degree on the availability of data, but it has uh, global applicability and I think that's a, another really intriguing aspect of, of this is that um, it's something that uh, we can bring and explore and how it can be uh, utilized uh, all over the world. So really excited for the demo and we're um, thrilled to be supporting the configuration for the Sacramento Valley and hopefully demonstrate the utility for this more broadly. David? Hi, can you all hear me? Yep. Yeah, good. Thanks, Paul. Um, also on the phone is um, Marshall from Upstream Tech, um, who can uh, participate in, in uh, answering any questions that come up. Um, we're just going to give a, a very brief walkthrough today of um, the Basin Scout platform and its intended function. Um, and then hopefully there will be time for some discussion afterwards. Um, the the purpose of of starting this um, this effort. So we are a, the Freshwater Trust is a not for profit with a conservation mission. Um, we have for decades seen um, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on the environment, and um, with the absence of technology to guide those investments, we've seen them distributed. It's not that those investments have been um, have been pointless. They haven't. They've been great, but they um, have lacked coordination to achieve a specific environmental objective. And when we began talking with Microsoft, um, we were seeing something similar with the types of language that Microsoft was using, and that is, it's not practical to think of, of Microsoft alone or any other company alone to achieve the conservation objectives that our ecosystems need. Uh, and if we could find a way to apply technology to guide collective investment and interagency cooperation and among the regulatory agencies, the regulated entities, what we are seeing is there are um, a lot of opportunities to be a lot more specific with investments um, to drive down the cost of achieving our eco ecological objectives. Um, essentially what we're interested in doing is putting a price tag and a finish line on the fix. And so the way we think about this right now, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. Um, so we are configuring the, the Basin Scout platform for the entire Sacramento Basin right now. What I'm gonna illustrate for you is a portion of that in Solano County today. Um, in order for us to say which actions in which place achieve the greatest ecological benefit for a specific water quality or quantity parameter, we have to know some really basic things about how land is managed. In this particular case, we're paying a lot of attention to agriculture. And in agriculture, we pay attention to those things <clears throat> that, that growers control, which is the crop, their, the crop they grow, their irrigation practice, their nutrient management practice, and their tillage practice. And with those four things, if we can understand what those are, we have a pretty good sense of the type of conservation practices that can be applied at any given field. And then more importantly, they have the ability to quantify the outcomes that are associated with those. So what you're seeing right now, and this gets to the portability piece that that Paul just mentioned. Um, these are the individual crops or individual fields that are delineated with crop type. 
Now you all have seen maps like this before, and I think that you often you see these in tax lot boundaries. These are field boundaries, and they are we understand the the field boundary, we understand the crop type, we understand the irrigation type, cover crop, orchard you're established, and what you're seeing here is is done with machines, and so. Marshall's team at Upstream, Upstream Tech has developed the machine learning algorithms that enable us to identify the, the delineate the fields, identify the crops, identify the, the tillage practices and the irrigation practices that enable us to then run a series of models to look at runoff reductions and um, irrigation efficiencies that we can gather. So when I, with that basic information, we have the ability to look at the the whole function. What's going on? What's going on right now in that basin? And so, with Basin Scout Platform, we're looking at the whole the whole basin or the whole area of interest here. In this case, we've got about 8,700 fields. We know within that 8,700 8, fields and that agricultural landscape, we have a pretty good sense of what the water usage is, what the infiltration looks like for groundwater recharge, what the nitrogen surface runoff is, and based on these are all current conditions. What we were interested in doing is saying that given, um, you know, resource constraints, given um, ecological interests and need, what are the types of things that we could do to start making improvements? And what the Basin Scout platform gives you the ability to do is create a range of programs. And so I'll come back to these programs, but we can start comparing different, <clears throat> different strategies related to um, the constraints that we put in. I'm going to illustrate what that looks like. I'm not going to run a program right now, but I'll just give you a sense of what it what it means. So we have the ability to say, what is your objective? I want water use reductions. I want to in I want to maximize infiltration. I want to decrease the runoff of nitrogen or phosphorus or sediment. And then importantly, I can look at individual crops like almonds, um, for example, there's a lot of almonds in this area. There are a lot of walnuts in this area. If I wanted to work with specific grower groups, I have the ability to select out specific crops. And then right now we're illustrating three actions. So we've got some irrigation improvements. That means converting a, a flood irrigation into pressurized irrigation or taking a, a sprinkler into drip or some sort of irrigation efficiency. Cover cropping is simply the cover, cover cropping during the winter time to help increase the amount of rain that is captured and the sediment that is loading that is stopped. And then a big one is managed aquifer recharge. So if you are connected in some way to um, a water right on a riparian area or a um, irrigation canal, you have the ability to take wintertime flow and turn that onto your field and recharge. It works in some crops and in some it doesn't. But we have the ability to look at constraints. So I can add constraints, whether I want to look at a cost constraint or I want to maximize a, I want to decrease water use by some volume. So all of these constraints, and you can add multiple constraints. So I'm not going, as I mentioned, I'm not going to create the a program, but I'm going to come back and illustrate what that, what that does. And so let's assume that I just created a program that says, um, I want, I have three and a half million dollars annually, and I want to maximize phosphorus uplift. I want to maximize the amount of phosphorus that is no longer running into a, a stream, but I don't want to decrease the recharge. And this is real important in California that what we're really interested in is groundwater health in addition to surface water quality. And so we don't want to go and um, we don't want to decrease the amount of irrigation water that is actually recharging the aquifer. So in this particular case, if I have three and a half million dollars and I put those constraints on, what I'm able to illustrate here is that for three million dollars on 236 fields, I can get a 22,000 pounds of nitrogen reduced, 137 pounds of phosphorus runoff reduced. We have an infiltration of, of benefit of infiltration of actual 14 acre feet. So remember, we didn't want it. We wanted a no net reduction and we actually got a slight increase. From that, I have the ability then to go into these individual fields and look at these individual fields and know what I would do at, that, at the specific place. And so this is a way, the purpose of this tool is if you 
are right now out there spending money and you say, I, I want to have a, I want some no net loss or I want to increase the, um, I want to increase the absorption or I want to increase the infiltration. There's this entire, there's an entire watershed that you would need to look at and you would have no idea really where to go. All of those projects kind of look the same when you're looking at a big map. In this particular case, what we're looking at is I don't have to guess which fields. I know specifically which fields I would go to for that for that particular scenario. So it's not all of these fields. It's these very specific fields. These are the 236 fields I would go to. And once I go there, I would know what I wanted to do. So not all actions are the same. Once I go to that specific field, I would know specifically what I would want to do on that field. So in this particular case, we have the ability to say that for this particular program, that what this is recommending is a sprinkler upgrade or a microservice, a, a, a micro upgrade. But when you go back to this, when you zoom out, we can do that and we can compare a range of alternatives. And so for each of these, that each of these scenarios, you're no longer, you're no longer saying, I only have $5 million and what do I need to do? What the Basin Scott platform is giving the ability to say very specifically where you would go. And our objective here is to increase the amount of time and energies people are going out and spending going to the, the highest priority places and decreasing the amount of time we're spending with um, grant processes and selection processes and, and, and hoping. Another important feature of, 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 the, of the platform is, is this. When I look at this entire basin, we've got 8,700 fields here. The, of that 8,700 fields, more than half of those fields have no viable conservation practice. And so as an example, when I look at this particular field, this only has two, I can upgrade to sprinkler system here. But when I look at this field, there's, there's no possible, there's no practice that is recommended. It's currently, um, it's a not irrigated, it's pasture land. I wouldn't, if I didn't have access to this information, I would end up I could go ahead and put a, we could look, be wasting our time looking at a potential project on that site. Versus if I come down to some of these higher priority areas, Walnut, for example, this irrigation, this field has a dozen individual practices that can be applied. And what the Basin Scout platform is looking at is not just the specific practice, but the combination of all of those practices on the field, and then the ability to say with with those individual practices or individual com combination of practices, what is the benefit from terms of water usage, water infiltration, nitrogen surface runoff, phosphorus, sediment, et cetera. And then it has a pretty quick and easy way to determine is that a net positive, is that net neutral, or is that net negative for, the, for any one of those parameters. So I know we only have just a, a, a few minutes for these things. And so I think that I will, um, I will stop there, ask Paul if there's anything in specifically that you would like me to illustrate that, um, would, that is better for this audience. Before you uh, get off your mic, uh, Paul, to answer that question of David's, I would just remind folks, if you have a question that you would like to enter into the Q&A function, please do so. Over to you, Paul. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll hold until the end of the discussion. That was uh, uh, a very great quick overview, David, of a really rich tool. Um, we do have our first question in, and we probably only have time for one or two questions before we need to press forward, but it's about um, a GHG and, and carbon sequestration. Are you also looking at co-benefits around carbon? The tool does not currently look at that, but it is um, like many of these things. Once we understand the practice that many of these practices have, especially cover crops, for example, have a GHD component, it is possible to link that. It is not currently linked in the existing Basin Scott platform. Got it. And then uh, our second and final question for now is, uh, are, is the tool uh, able to do a basic uh, return on investment calculation? 
the what the tool looks at right now is a um, the the actual cost of the implementation, and then it also has the ability to look at the opportunity cost for individual growers. And so, what it's looking, what it's giving um, users is the ability to say for a grower, um, here is the implementation cost, and then linking to the potential yield benefit or decrease. That so it gets into the the ability to help work with individual growers um, on um, on a particular practice but it, in terms of return on investment in an investment way no it's really an ecologically driven tool got it so there is one question uh, coming from Raul about uh, where the data sources are and I'm just wondering either uh, David uh, if you could just type your answer directly through a private message back to Raul I, I think that's a big question and there's a lot of um, do it. I don't know if we have time for it. We have another question, though, that I think is perhaps a little more broadly applicable and less technical, which is, uh, what what is the the what's the runway time for getting this tool applied to a different basin, cost-wise and time-wise? Do you have a general sense of what it would uh, what it would take to apply this, let's say, to a basin in southern India? Yeah, we talked about this a little bit um, last week. I think that when we transfer to new areas, there's just this basic process that of the data availability, the data gap analysis, the acquisition costs, and then the the functional performance. In an area like the Sacramento, where we have really, really good data um, for machine learning model training and for um, validation, and we have really good models, then you're, obviously the function and the costs are less. When we go to other places, is we will go through a process that a, a pretty standard process of data availability, the cost of acquisition of gaps, and the desired function. So it's a, it's it's not the it's you know we can't say that it's you know twelve cents Once. an acre. It's yeah. there, it, will be, it will be variable. Right. Um, okay. And time wise. Is that also variable by basin? It's just it, a function of what kind of data are available and gap filling is needed. Yeah, that's right. And I think that uh, it's also a function of um, the functional performance one is needed. It, one needs, if it, you're looking simply at a risk assessment versus the ability to say which specific action of these 12 actions on a given field, the the variation there changes. So I think that's the type of thing that we we want to be looking at with individual users in other places. Yep. Got it. I um, this is, I know we can take a lot more questions. This is a, a super tool and platform, uh, but we can perhaps revisit it when we also move into the open discussion. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit now. Um, Dow uh, has had a partnership now. Uh, well, let me back up a little bit. Dow has been leading in investments in nature based solutions for a long time now. And uh, today is going to um, present a partnership uh, with Nature Conservancy and Ecometrics uh, around a screening tool uh, for ecosystem services. Over to you, Franz. Perfect. Thank you, um, Jason. And um, I'm going to wave and say hello um, so that people can relate to the face to the voice, but I'll, I will stop the video just to make sure that my audio um, comes out clear. Um, so, a very um, cool tool with the Basin Scout. Um, thank you, Paul, and others to share. And you will see in, in the EASY tool, um, and the acronym was chosen to replicate what the intent of the tool is, is um, essentially DAO was challenged by our CEO back in 2011 to say, go figure out how to include nature in every single business decision that we make. That quickly translated to our Dow internal team as to the need to quantify ecosystem services. And we basically had the, the challenge to say two routes, right? Either we, we um, hire ecosystem um, service consultants such as, as the the ESG, right, Ecosystem Sol Solutions Group, um, and we send them off to look at every single DAO site. They come back with giving us the total value of DAO's natural capital. Um, the option that we favored was really to, if we are to become um, embedded with the nature lens in every decision that we make, 
There's a need for us to take boots to the ground. There's a need for our project managers who are responsible and caretakers of the land that Dow owns and neighboring properties that they need to comprehend and, and learn the ecosystem services language. So the tool was devised with that intent. And, and therefore, you'll see um, with my colleagues uh, that I have here, Jim Stout from the Nature Conservancy and Kevin Halsley from ESG, um, how we've crafted this tool to help such as we're um, really impacting the collective action with, with the WRC, right, is, is to give us a tool that allows us to really understand and bring nature into um, the design table. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll um, leave um, Jim to start this discussion. Great. Thank you, Franz. Can we move to the next slide, please? So at the Nature Conservancy, our mission is pretty broad. It's to conserve the land and waters upon which all life depends. We're really excited to be a project partner for the CEO water mandate and have been excited to be in what is approaching the 10th year of collaboration with Dow. Um, can you flash forward one? There's, there we go. So um, since 1995, Dow has been issuing a uh, progressive set of sustainability goals every 10 years, building on the previous set. Uh, in 2015, they issued a set of goals for the next 10 years through 2025, uh, one of which was to include valuing nature. Uh, at that point, we had worked together uh, between the Nature Conservancy and Dow for about four years, and they were ready to say they were going to incorporate the value of nature into every one of their business decisions. And so since then, um, you know, we have been working with Dow to try to help them roll that out across the company and really to uh, build it into the culture. It's been pretty amazing seeing the transformation uh, from when we started back in 2011 uh, to now where the company really, you know, it's part of their uh, operations manual. You have to consider nature in every one of your decisions. Any capital projects need to be screened. Um, and, uh, you know, they're really considering nature as they um, make any type of decision. So it's, it's been pretty cool to watch that uh, evolve. Next slide, please. So with the easy tool, what were we trying to accomplish? Uh, when we started in 2011, uh, a lot of people knew that ecosystem services had value. They had no idea how to quantify them. Uh, we did a, a number of foundational analyses with Dow up front to try to show how ecosystem services have uh, value in different places. We looked at, um, okay, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Uh, we looked at reforestation uh, to re reduce pollutants. We looked at um, investments in watersheds, similar to what the, the water mandate is doing. Um, you know, trying to incent different users to operate differently and to use water differently and how that would have a return on investment. And we looked at uh, restoration of coastline using uh, marshland to try to enhance the protective capabilities of that coastline. And so with the output of those three studies, we, were, we determined that there were ways to quantify ecosystem services. So with that in hand, uh, Dow and TNC went to try to figure out how we were going to build this into a tool. Uh, Eco's, Ecometric Solutions Group was uh, one of the best players in the industry. They had done a lot of work, um, built a lot of models to help calculate that, um, but there wasn't an automation. So between the three organizations, we came together to develop the easy tool. Next slide, please. So. Uh, as you see, this is the easy tool. It's pronounced easy because it's meant to be easy. It's an iPad based tool, uh, which users can take out to a specific site and uh, answer 40 or so questions that, you know, somebody um, off the street could easily walk around the site and answer. So, you know, it's, it's just different uh, attributes about the site. And then that site, uh, then the tool uh, takes the information that's answered from the answers to the questions and has uh, modeling going on behind it um, that translates it into engineering metrics that can be built back into um, 
capital models that the companies are using both from an investment standpoint as well as from an engineering standpoint. Next slide, please. All right, France. You're muted if you're talking, Franz. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Jason. Um, so in reality, right, when you look at the easy tool, it was designed around the principle of the ecosystem service cascade. So essentially the cascade um, depicted here illustrates that the ecological processes that are embedded in the flow of the benefits that nature provides that we, we call ecosystem services, right? Are, are to be model act if they are to be modeled accurately, you require an assessment of, of key attributes conditions on the landscape. So, for example, vegetative structure, soil conditions, water regime, topography. And, and if you look at the diagram on the right, um, the graphic illustrates one of the key ecological service here that is embedded in the easy tool is the water quantity control. And it depicts how trees and other vegetation, soil, depression, depressional areas, slope, all of the above enable the performance of ecological processes that are then tied to water quality um, control, such as infiltration, interception, and, and water storage. Um, the next slide. So uh, at the onset, very similar to what we heard about the Basin Scout, right, currently the tool is built with the ability um, to quantify the list of ecosystem services that you, that you see here. Those were the, the key ones that DAO felt would be most useful from a, a DAO perspective. And it's the tool that was built though in, in order to make it available for the public. So the tool is, is available publicly right now with the hopes that other services um, such as for example, pollination or biodiversity could easily be brought into the tool. Next slide. So the, the key of, of the easy tool, right, is really the ability to quantify um, scientifically robust models um, because if you look at, at Dow, right, the only way that I will convince our project managers to try alternative solutions is really to put quantifying data in their hands. And in order to do that, we build the tool with the ability to translate ecosystem services into um, easily digestible pieces of data. Um, so you can look here at, this is the, my favorite way of looking at it, is really actually to look at the functions that are being performed and the ability to compare past conditions to present conditions that can then be um, translated into percent change um, by the whole gamut of um, ecological functions that you see here. The intent of, of displaying the, the panoply of services is also to embed in our engineers that nature doesn't maximize, it tends to optimize. And therefore it's really key when you try to focus on one service that you understand the implication on the other services that nature provides. Um, uh, if you roll up for one more, you'll see um, the, the same data has now been rolled into a percent performance. And again, you can see across the various performances from a, um, an alternative scenario, right? You're able to collect baseline um, data and then apply different alternatives or different design ideas and see how that impacts um, the percent performance of your project. And, and then and one more level up, um, if you click one more time, this is also a, a different view, able to translate that performance onto um, a context area of mapping um, that we also saw in Basin Scout that quickly um, drives visually the impact of your potential change. Next slide. 
And so we'd like to show you now, we're going to shift to, um, so that's a, a really quick scenario of what the tool is and its background functioning. Um, really to us though, the, the, the test is, is how has this tool transformed within DAO and also outside of DAO. So we'll go quickly through a few case studies um, um, to share with you today. The next slide. So this is, is um, one of my preferred um, projects. It actually occurred as we were developing the tool and really trying to convince, convince us that this would be useful, that uh, this tool would allow our engineers to make better decisions. And I have to say I was not sold um, at the onset, so it did take um, it did take me to take boots to the ground, essentially, and really see the, the tool in action. So this is a property um, owned by Dow. Um, in the purple, you see that this is the area that used to be where you used to have a, um, an old ash pond um, tied to a coal-fired um, plant. And the property did have issues. Uh, as you see, it's located along the Tibawasi River and with um, the MDEQ, we wanted to, um, to uh, ensure that there's no migration of concern um, pollutants into the water. We approached um, the Dow project team. They already had a plan um, to apply the traditional solution, which would have been empty the existing pond, cap it, um, and, and uh, maintain wells all around to control the water into perpetuity. So we took the tool with um, our folks um, from the Nature Conservancy and ESG and our project managers. We all met at the field with um, our, our easy tool at AND, and we um, walked the field to really understand what was the baseline, so what was nature telling me as far as ecosystem services that were being performed at the site. What we saw was basically that nature had already overtaken the pond, and we saw a beautiful wetland, actually, and, and meadows all around. Um, so that established the baseline services. Next slide. And you see depicted here um, what the tool was able to challenge um, us with was that in in um, in blue you have the baseline um, condition and various alternatives were applied to all of these key ecosystem services so the the initial condition of baseline um, basically as I depicted right had a wetland and um, a, a meadow in the area and um, a flow of water through the property. Now we modeled the um, conditions that were proposed in the alternative solution of cap and treat, which dropped the ecological performance services overall. Um, so we challenged the team and said, well, what could we do if you use the benchmark and baseline conditions as it's not acceptable to lower the performance of your site if you're going to do a land use change. What could we come up with? And we, we um, amongst ourselves, in discussion with um, TNC and, and our project managers, we came up with the idea of, well, what if we excavated the material that is, is causing of concern, put it in appropriate landfill, and restore the site as it's um, performing today as, as a wetland. Um, the project manager was quickly, you know, leveling all the ground, let's sheet flow everything into the beautiful wetland, and let's uh, make every, everything flat. We quickly learned from the Nature Conservancy that, well, no, wait a second, you know, you don't have to um, to level everything as, as engineers love to do. Nature loves vernal pools. It loves depressional area. So with, with all of the folks on the ground, we quickly came up with a much improved solution, which was then translated into a much better performance while also saving $2 million over the life of the project. Next slide. 
and, and here again depicted is what you see as far as the um, proposed solution in number one. Number two is where we landed with our optimal solution uh, of restoring the site. The third component, um, which was again really, uh, really cool, was to see that the city's adjacent property could also be interconnected, and we suggested a design to them, which um, they now have acquired the funds to propagate. So recognizing again that the services of ecosystem services can be applied beyond the Dow fence line. And, and the intent to make this tool public is, of course, to, um, as, as with the collective action of the WRC, right, is to bring a, co a, a consortium of folks acting on a piece of land um, um, to better the, the overall performance of um, our projects. Next slide. I will tr uh, then pass um, the mic to Kevin Halsey. Thank you, Ferrant. <clears throat> so just real quick, uh, just a, a couple of slides. In the, uh, the, the point of these slides is to show, so this tool was developed to help Dow and to answer the questions that Dow has. Uh, but subsequent to developing the tool, uh, our goal at ADSG has been to identify what are all the other contexts out there where it could be useful. I mean, the idea of quantifying ecosystem services is it really is an effective way of, of feeding important information into decision-making processes about land management. So we were curious about all the other instances out there where this would have applicability. And I've got just a couple of, uh, of quick examples. Um, something we're doing with Ford Motor Company, you know, the, uh, the idea being they really want to know, in terms of sustainability, how would nature solve the problem? So what we've been doing with them is evaluating high-performing uh, reference habitats around their, their facilities and looking at uh, what would an appropriate target be for performance. Right? So that's one way you can use the tool. Uh, but then you can also use the tool to evaluate potential solutions that they come up with in terms of changing processes or redesigning uh, facilities. Let's go next slide. And moving to a completely different context, uh, we've been doing work with an aid organization in some developing countries around the world where you have very poor data to start with. There is no available data, uh, but using the tool to help diagnose uh, how changes in ecological conditions have really led to uh, a lot of problems and, and terrible conditions within some of these places. Uh, this particular project was a food security project because even though they have this part of DRC has some of the most fertile cropland in the world, they're not producing. Uh, they're, they've got frequent floods washing away crops. They've got pests and diseases. Uh, destroying crops. They've got uh, occasional droughts uh, affecting their crops and their soil quality is diminishing rapidly because of overuse of the soil. And it's an area where there's been massive deforestation. And so uh, in this location, one of the things we were brought in to do for this was identify, well, how have ecological conditions changed in such a way that it's making farming less viable in this place where it should absolutely be thriving? Uh, and again, I mean, that's, that's really, that's the point of these types of tools is feeding that important information into these different processes about how do we manage our landscape? How do we think about our landscape? Uh, and let's go to the, the next slide, please. So, and this, this really kind of summarizes uh, largely what, what everybody has been, been talking about during this presentation is, this is something that uh, can be applied in a lot of different ways. These are all of the different types of users that have been using the tool. Uh, but it, this is always about helping to understand that flow of information, the, the decision-making process. What are ecosystems doing? How are they performing? And how does the composition of the landscape attributes on the ground affect those outcomes? And let's go to the next slide. 
So the, uh, the easy tool is not intended to be stagnant. It's intended to grow and evolve over time. Uh, it was originally developed for DAO. And so the, uh, the list of ecosystem services that are in there were driven by those services that were most useful to DAO. However, uh, the system is modular. Additional services can be added uh, and can be added quite easily technically although there's the cost of reprogramming every time you add more services. Uh, but uh, the ultimate goal is to have a much expanded list of services in the tool, uh, to actually have like a uh, model library that, that users can select from to identify um, which services are relevant to the, the context that they're working within. Uh, we would like to have the backend then programmed so that as you select models, the data sheet that goes uh, that is created within your uh, your iPad, which is the data collection portion of the tool, is uh, automatically pulls those attributes that are relevant for you to collect data on. So, if you only need information on one service, you you aren't having to do data collection on all of the attributes out there. Now, we do advocate that you should always have as wide a selection of services as possible because one of the really important aspects of the tool is the ability to look at trade-offs. Uh, as you change the landscape and you improve performance of some services, you're frequently going to find that other services decrease, right? And it's that optimization point that Franz was talking about. So, um, uh, but having the ability to really select the services appropriate to your context would be useful. Uh, and then providing analysis tools. Uh, for instance, the uh, uh, working with Disney, we, we developed a, a crosswalk between the output for our air temperature regulation service and the universal th thermal comfort index. So that you could see as you change the score uh, of that service, what would it do for the annual production of thermal comfort in that location? And they were able to, uh, to use that to think about, well, how should we be landscaping in these areas to make it so that, uh, that our visitors could actually be comfortable in this location would want to hang around there and stay uh, as opposed to be driven out by uncomfortable temperatures. So building those types of analysis tools that help the user understand what to do with the information. And I'll wrap it up there. Um, and and open it up for questions. Great, uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, we do have about 10 minutes remaining. Um, we had uh, one question from Susan on whether slides will be shared and the answer is yes. Although instead of doing a whole bunch of screenshots uh, of the first presentation, we're actually also recording this and we'll be able to share uh, the link so you can actually see that demo uh, or share it with your colleagues within your company. Also, Susan, uh, if, uh, if you have any comments you would like to share uh, from a Ford perspective and using the tool, we'd welcome that as well. Um, we are uh, 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 possibly going to be able to open uh, this up to um, verbal uh, inputs if you would rather. If you just have quick questions and you want to use the chat function, we'll try to do as many of those as possible. Let us know by the chat function if you would like uh, to uh, make an input um, uh, for um, uh, uh, verbally and we'll uh, try to unmute um, mute you. Um, so um, there's a question from Ellen about uh, data and maybe we can use, it seems now that there's two uh, questions relating to these tools and the data uh, uh, that's required for them to be effective. Um, at, does um, either uh, of the tool developers want to say a little bit about um, the data limitation issue and how much this hampers use and uptake of the tools uh, or whether in fact data is the limiting factor or whether it's other items? Who wants to try to respond to that? <clears throat> That's a big question. I wondered if Marshall from Upstream would be willing to comment on that. You're muted if you're talking, Marshall. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, and David, chime in here if you have any thoughts too. Um, 
Yeah, go ahead, Marshall. I... Yeah, I think I think in general, um, you know, the the way we're approaching how we're building Basin Scout is uh, is specifically to design all of the models and approaches and techniques such that you know, as soon as we want to look at a new region or even a new domain, uh, we're set up to do just that um, without building an entirely new system or starting from scratch. Um, where machine learning comes into play is that uh, it really automates that process of hand designing and hand calibrating tools or, or models rather. Um, and so that is kind of the, the key piece of uh, speeding up that process. Um, so that's, that's, it's really a, a tool that should be reached for, um, but not necessarily like the panacea for solving these types of problems. Um, but we found it to be very effective in these situations. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead, please. Who's going to come in? No, that's fine, Jason. Let's keep us moving. Okay. And I was just going to Go ahead, Franz. I was going to ask if the if you wanted to respond to the data question as well. Sure, and, and I'll ask Kevin um, to chime in after me as well. So, from a from an easy tool standpoint, right? You you saw that there's a collection of land attributes that are visually collected um, by um, non ecologists, and and the tool is built with the app with a lot of pictures um, to help you in that collection of attributes. And there's roughly, um, if I remember correctly, about 30 different quest questions that um, walk you through that series of key attributes to take. Um, and, and then uploads those attributes into the models um, that then uh, can be translated in, into ecosystem services. Um, I will say as well that um, the experience level, um, you do need to be trained um, on the tool. We have an internal training um, session that, that we offer our, our dog colleagues, um, but it is built as a screening level tool to help, you, uh, to help inform. Now, if I take boots to the ground and do the Riverside projects of 23 acres, right? We were there with three people. It took, took us roughly, uh, I'll say about two to three hours to cover that space. Now, if you move to the project that um, Kevin shared in the Congo, um, how you can elevate um, that the same tool is to reference key areas that are performing similarly uh, from an ecological standpoint and then replicate that across um, your mapping process. So the tool is really adaptable to cover um, from one acre in, in details to several um, hundreds of acres um, mm -hmm. via uh, using imagery, a combination of imagery and um, spot reference sites that you then amalgamate. Um, so I really see the tool, like the Basin Scout and, and our tool, right? It's they really they really work in synergies where you try to use a high-level mapping, get the most of that, and then um, and then uh, confirm what you're seeing from that by um, going on site and, and talking to the key people. The the Easy Tool was me meant and built around bringing key stakeholders together. Um, at their site um, to, to inform business decision and land use change management options. So, so hopefully that, that helps. And then Kevin, you can chime in as well. Uh, that's a pretty good answer, Franz. Uh, um, I, I would say the, uh, when, the only thing I would add is when you're expanding the tool to a basin-wide or a, or a region, regional application, um, it really depends on the heterogeneity of the landscape as to how easy or simple that was. In the, in the Congo, uh, because of all the deforestation and conversion to cropland, there were really only five different land cover types that we could identify. There were remnant areas of forest 
there were areas of attempted reforestation where they were planting eucalyptus, and then there were a couple different crop types, and then uh, some grassland uh, areas where they were grazing. And they'd done a pretty effective job of converting the landscape to just those cover types. And so it was relatively easy to take a selection of references from each of those, uh, those typical land cover types and then extrapolate out across the entire uh, uh, study area. Uh, as it gets more heterogeneous, uh, as the area landscape gets more uh, heterogeneous, uh, that does increase the level of effort if you're going to capture in any level of detail all of the different, uh, all of the different land cover types. Great. We only have a couple of minutes remaining. I do want to try to tackle or get your thoughts uh, from the panelists on this second question. It sounds like the easy tool has been used as uh, a, a decision support tool that allows stakeholders to come together and uh, identify the best opportunities mm -hmm. for collective action. I'm just wondering for the Basin Scout platform, whether there's been experience using this diagnostic tool as a way to drive uh, a shared understanding of the, the, the highest priority uh, opportunities. And if you could speak to that, that would be great. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think that we have used the analytics that are embedded in the Basin Scout platform for numerous regulatory programs. Um, one of the, the largest is we converted a, a, a program uh, 401 certification for relicensing of a dam in, the, um, in Idaho that was going to spend gobs and gobs of money on a, um, on a pump system that would have actual negative environmental consequences. And instead, using these analytics, we're able to help bring the stakeholders, including the regulatory agencies responsible for, for permitting and the utility along to drive a $350 million restoration program that recovers riparian, riparian areas in stream channel habitat and decreases sediment loads. And so in terms of the ability of what we have found is often in when we're dealing with um, large landscape people that understand that there are some significant water quality or quantity problems, there is the limitation of being able to know what needs to happen where, and typically the, the sense is it costs something close to infinity to make the improvements that are needed. What we have seen in every single case where we've applied these analytics is the cost for the improvements that we know we need are less expensive, and when you focus your attention on the places that deliver the highest value, that it not only is less expensive, but we can get there on a timeline that is meaningful for the ecosystem. And so in terms of helping to coordinate investments, the Basin Scott platform enables people to see in this landscape that's pretty fuzzy, very specifically how coordinated investment can add up to making the types of objectives, to reaching your objectives. One thing we weren't unable to illustrate here is we also have the tracking component to this. And so a, a tool that looks at the static conditions is really useful for just that year. The value of bringing machine learning into this is the, the vast majority of improvements we need to make in the agricultural landscape change on an ongoing basis. And so the dynamism that comes with advanced technologies and things like machine learning enable us to continue to adaptively manage and change our recommendations for the basin scale based on the things that are happening throughout the throughout the year so it gives Eight, eight, it gives companies the ability to compare the investments against them against individual sites, track progress, not only for their own performance, but com in comparison with what the ecosystem needs and also with what each other is doing. So I, I think that the, uh, the, the dynamic nature of a, of a basin scale tool that links site level actions to basin scale ecological objectives is super important when thinking about collective investment to achieve our eco ec ecological objectives. Great, that's a, that's a great way to uh, wrap this session up. So um, uh, Paul, I, I see that you've inserted the comment that we are, uh, you're interested in seeing if the Basin Scout platform can be used uh, in other water resilience coalition basins. I, I very much hope so. I hope we can have that conversation uh, in the coming weeks. 
uh, uh, the Sacramento Valley where this tool is being applied is one of the priority basins identified by the WRC. So if any company on this call is interested in learning more about how to engage in that effort in Northern California, please get in contact uh, with us and uh, we'll be uh, making sure um, to plug you into that conversation. Thank you again for your time, everyone. And we will, uh, we will, uh, oh, and I see that the easy tool as well uh, is uh, potential for uh, scaling uh, in uh, the WRC's work. Uh, I hope that's a good point. Thank you, Franz. Uh, as mentioned, we'll circulate the slides and also the link where you can see this recording. Uh, thanks all for your time today and have a good rest of your day.